We're coming, and we ain't backing down. We don't need a bunch of cats in here. Yeah, looking in the mirror. Everybody, did you do your job. You understand that? Hey, will you shut up? I'm bitterly disappointed with the officiating today. Guys being dudes. And they run through our <laughs> like through a tin horn, man. Ah, yeah. Thank you, Lee. Fellas, I think we hold an old school understanding of how teams work and especially how the front offices of teams work. We talk about front offices a lot in the NFL and in professional sports. We tend to not focus on them a lot in college sports for a few reasons that are understandable and I get it. But I think a lot of people at least have a baseline knowledge that their teams are functioning differently in the NIL era. Everybody can see it. But I do want to dig a little bit deeper and talk through something that I think we miss about the under the radar value of a certain type of staffer on a college football staff, general manager, director of player personnel, associate AD of football performance or whatever the hell you want to call them. So this show's big topic is the rise of the college GM role. And specifically, what I think that role says and can mean about college football staff diversity. But first, our friends at Homefield Apparel, as usual, sponsor this show and every other show. I'm obviously repping a Homefield Apparel t shirt. I am Team Homefield more than I am Team pretty much anything else besides a few. Uh, Stephen Godfrey, sir. Are we three wide? No, nope, too wide. Three wide, two wide. What we got today? I can't home field. I'm, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm out of country this week. Uh, shout out to home I'm field. Hey, I did, before Alex talks, I have been on the road for 12 days working on a project, and I made sure to pack a home field shirt for SCD. So shout out to the Hokies of Virginia Tech. And uh, Alex, I'm sorry, you were saying something? I'm out of the country. I tried to bring a home field crew neck into the nation of Canada. And I was told, sir, that's a weapon. We can't let you bring that into our country. You look too good. <laughs> too powerful. Too powerful. Exactly. Uh, yeah. if, if, you want to, if you want to join Alex in, uh, in the possession of an international weapon of war, uh, homefieldapparel.com. The code is SZD20 for 20% off of your first order at homefieldapparel.com. Check what they're releasing this month. Uh, I believe they're, they're calling it March Mania, if I have that correct. Uh, there are powerful, powerful items of clothing. Uh, this show is also brought to you by our friends at Nokian Tires. Nokian Tires, uh, if you want to move, if you want some power underfoot of your vehicle in this, there's some, there's some snow somewhere, right? It's snow in the Northeast. I'm around like, snow right now, seeing all kinds of yeah, it. All right. All right. It's snowed in New York tires. this week. I was in New York. Yeah, it snowed. Get you some Nokian tires uh, underfoot for your vehicle. Uh, and of course, Substack, also a proud partner of what we do here at Split Zone Duo, splitzoneduo.com for all of our premium content. Uh, by the time that you are listening to this, we will have Stephen Godfrey with one Dan Wetzel on the feed uh, talking about Death to the BCS, a book that he has talked about for literal years uh, regarding the the first thing that I think Godfrey you saw as this like canary in the coal mine essentially, um, and and you sat down with the man himself to talk about how all of that reporting and and how that book came together and and the lasting effect that it has on how you probably should view the sport. Went to Michigan and talked shit about the Rose Bowl with someone from Michigan who likes to talk shit about the Rose Bowl. It was a good time. No they're probably not going to let you back. Uh, I will also have a one-on-one with Madeline Hill, the proprietor of Impersonal Foul, which is a tremendous Substack blog. We're going to talk sports gossip. We're going to gossip a lot uh, about college football, the Georgia Bulldogs, uh, and we're going to have a fun time doing that. Her work can be found at Impersonal Foul. She does great, very interesting work and a very interesting um, just lens into covering sports. But Let's have an interesting lens to talk about college football today. And let's use this interesting lens to talk about the task of team building for ever, basically. And this is not a rhetorical question. I actually kind of want you guys to answer it until, you know, call it 2010 ish. What was y'all's understanding? And Alex, I'll start with you. What was your understanding of the task 
of team building for a college football coach and staff? How, how has that been posed to us? I think that my nearly lifelong understanding of building a roster in college football and just about everything that, that surrounds the day-to-day -day management of a college football team has been confined into the head coach because it's convenient and because that is the easiest way to think about program management. And for, for decades, maybe it wasn't unreasonable. Uh, like in the time of the bear or in the time of Bud Wilkinson or in the time of Bobby Bowden or Joe Paterno or pick your cult of personality head football coach in the last 50, 60, 70 years of the sport, I think that the easiest way to perceive the programs that they've built is that they are doing it because they are all powerful, because they seem to be very connected. They are the ones with the political ties, with the business ties in the community. They're the front man for everything about the program. And so you think, or at least I would think, did a thing happen in the college football program? Yes. Okay. The head coach did it. The head coach had his fingerprints all over that, whether that was deciding who to offer, deciding who to run off, sorting out depth charts, organizing visit weekends, things like that. And uh, I've realized in the last five or 10 years that that's become a bit outdated if it was ever true. I think my answer is like a variation of that. Um, when I started covering college football, when I was in college, we were just starting to acknowledge and kind of hype up the idea that a particular head coach or position coach was a recruiting coach. Not that that was his job, that that's what he was good at. And that really started because at the time, coaches would get hired and it was kind of novel that they would lead with recruiting. That's insane to talk about now, right? It's insane to, to think of like you would have a coach come in and say something about like, hey, we have to have good players. This program's only as good as its players, something like that. But at the time, it was like, it, this is the early aughts. Like this was, this was considered to be like, oh, wow, what a new and refreshing way of looking at the sport. And so we didn't, to your point, Richard, have like, you know, the idea of like a recruiting person was just, it didn't really exist so much as there were labels of like, oh, that guy's a recruiter. And then one step past that was, you knew on every SEC team that like when I covered the SEC and the aughts, like that running backs coach or that wide receivers coach, he's the guy. And the guy was often a career position coach, often a minority, I would say like two thirds of the time. And was the guy who was like really from that particular area, if not that state, then certainly that region. But that's about as far as it went. Yeah. I, I think that, I think that some of that is an – college football, it's – college football is forever in between the pseudo high school and the pseudo professional. And I think, obviously, in recent times, we, we, are, we get more and more closer and closer to the professional um, game. You know, we ain't going back towards the high school game in college football. I think we all understand that. But – and and you can – Quibble with the NFLification of college football. You can, you can not like it. You can like it. Um, but it is the truth, whether you want to like it or not. And I think that as we get closer to the NFLification, the professionalization, it probably is the right word, uh, of college football, you have to look at how these teams are being built. I think that it was all fine and dandy in 1995 to say, oh, well, we get the young men and we roll the ball out there and, and, you know, we have a lot of success, but it's, and I think honestly, recruiting rankings and their, the, the metrification of high school athletes starting right around 2005, 2006, 2007, I think changed this, right? You, we can put a number right on, on the young men that Alabama has recruited and that LSU has recruited and Ohio State has recruited. That whole economy really changed things because then it became a legitimate competition. It wasn't just you showed up on signing day and you read the blurb in the newspaper or, or maybe you heard, maybe you were in Texas and you heard about the young man from wherever suburb in Houston 
who was racking up 4,000 yards or whatever. And he was sort of this like mythical figure. And then he showed up on campus and, and then you watch his maturation, yada, yada, yada. But this is different. You, you have highlight tapes on these guys. Um, you know, you have a number on these guys. He's at camps. He's yada, yada, yada. And so the task of recruiting operations in college football had already changed. Then you add the portal in. And when the portal came in and when the, um, and when the COVID years came in, 2018, the fundamental alt, yeah, 1920 kind of thing. The, the fundamental op, uh, alteration of the operation, I think, has created this. You got to have a proper scouting department. You got to have a proper, and at the highest level, you know, and I'm not picking on Georgia State. It's just the first team that came in my mind. Georgia State, I understand it's going to be going to be a little bit difficult for you to build up a, a infrastructure to scout at the college level and the high school level. I mean, G5 coaches, for instance, I had a G5 coach tell me that uh, he borrowed a pro football focus login from his previous school to scout players uh, because you know, the resources were a little threadbare. But as far as top 30-ish is concerned, your college football team has a college scouting department and they have a high school scouting department. That is the way it is because the, the talent acquisition in the sport is so widespread and so important that it necessitates that. At the high school level, I think the high school and college level, I think, are very different because the high school level involves a significant amount of hospitality and relationship maintenance. The this is why at the top 30 level of the sport, I have said for a while, the CEOE has to go up and the ball coachy can afford to come down as far as how you have success. Because if you're running a real deal recruiting war machine, particularly at the high school level, that is a hospitality infrastructure. That is when we get them on campus, that, that running the visits and run, like that, that is a whole operation. It's in Texas and Junior Day. Right, right. And, and, and th there is the relationship maintenance, the people that you have that are writing them cards and texting them. And then you're an assistant coach and you come off the practice field and you get handed on a, a, a cell phone. And that assistant says, hey, here are the people that you texted today. You should probably give them a call tonight. Like that's a whole other animal. Um, you know, visit operations is a whole other animal for the highest level college football programs. Is is high school recruiting more hospitality based than transfer recruiting because the transfer has already had the locker room with the iPad and the waterfall and the high schooler is just like, wow, I I I train in kind of a ratty gym and Look at all this nice stuff that I could have if I go to this big time college. Is that the difference? Like why one is so much more hospitality based than the other? Because it's clear like Without you don't see a ton of transfers taking transfers do not take as many pictures with sports cars or well, yeah. thrown You're, chairs. Remember, it's whatever. also rite of passage. So it's a, there, there's an emotional component too, Alex, which is that like it's you're 18 and it's it's a little bit like getting your driver's license. So yeah. I, I yeah, I think I think schools lean into that because like also to your point, Alex. You know why you're not taking pictures when you're transfer visiting? Your parents are probably not with you. And a lot of these mm. high school kids are taking these trips as a, it's like a family moment. I know that like, dude, when my oldest, who's nine now, starts looking at high schools in like six years, uh, I, I meant colleges, uh, in six years or five years or whatever. Um, Damn, sorry, I just fossilized. Flies, huh? Yeah. That, <laughs> right. But, but it, that, that's the bit. The bit, it, the bit is, the, is the truth, which is like, it's a seminal moment. And so high schools or colleges are smart in high school recruiting, I think. And Richard, I don't know if this is going to maintain because we're professionalizing the sport. So maybe like maybe a top high school prospect and, and I'll, I'll throw it back to you. Like may, maybe it's less a rite of passage and maybe they're going to come in and be more worldly and more educated and treat it more like a business endeavor than like, oh, mom, this campus is so cool. Or like, hey, look, you know, look at the training facility or like, you know. Maybe it's going to lose some of that innocence. Well, you know, you made a good point there because like Spencer Rattler told me, like he didn't even see South Carolina before he showed up. Right. I mean, he just showed up on campus because he knew Shane Beamer and he knew Austin Stogner and they made it work. Um, th there were. And it's funny because in the NFL, like. People will say, will tell you that and this has changed in the last like four or five years, but 
you go back like five or so years, people will tell you that these facilities at college, uh, on college campuses, like blue NFL teams facilities, some of them, like out of the water. Like people will tell you like Washington's yeah. former facility, the, the commander's former facility was horrific, right? Because you don't necessarily need to build the spaceship facility to attract free agents. That's part and parcel of it. But there are other things you can sell. You can sell Legacy. You can sell City. You can sell Super Bowl. You can sell all these different things to a NFL free agent. And I think a similar thing is true in college. A college football player who has played two or three years, they've done it. They, they, that thing is done. That, 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 you don't need to play that game to get them on campus. And I also think that the college visit thing, th there are so many things that are different about a college athlete's experience than their peers on campus. But and, and when they're in high school, I mean, a lot of them enroll early and skip their senior prom, for instance. But there is something, you know, almost kind of sweet about the fact that the official visit apparatus is the one thing that is actually pretty similar in some ways to their peers, right? Like your parents take you on college visits. That's kind of a, a thing that when you're a teenager, you do with your parents, whether you want to or not. Uh, and and as, a, as a high school football player, it is something that you can do with your parents that is something that your friends do with their parents as well, obviously. It's a little bit different when you step on campus, but, you know, bare bones, it's very similar. Yeah. So. When you when you tie in everything that that needs to happen with the high school um, visit infrastructure, then you throw on NIL and managing NIL and the fact that college athletes that are probably transferring are asking about NIL and, and you're dealing with effectively the fact that you probably need a salary cap guy um, to slot. You know, I have a spreadsheet that kind of tells you kind of how mythically you would slot all the salaries to make that work. I mean, you gotta have somebody to make that work and you're hearing more and more and more. I mean, hell, that's why Jeff Halfley left to go to the Packers. You know, the task of a college football head coach has never been more different. They will tell you. And some of that, a lot of that has to do with the task of building a roster, Alex. Also, you know, these rules change all of the time. And will continue to change. But for the first few years of quote unquote name, image, and likeness payments, it's not been technically allowed for the general manager or the head coach or anyone to be doing the salary cap work in conjunction with a collective, with a third party. It will not surprise anyone that they do. I have laid eyes upon a text from a front office person to a collective person that was like, yeah, go up to 480k for this player. Like they have <laughs> like they have the spreadsheets in the building, they have the spreadsheets out of the building. And you don't want Richard, correct me if I'm wrong, you don't want the people running the scouting and doing the budgeting to actually be the ones at the collective. Like the collective's job is to tell the the GM, tell the cap guy, here's here's what we got. Like here's here's your total nest egg that we can spend for you. It is not to say we need 420K for edge rushers this year. Yeah. Oh, and, oh. and go ahead. I, I want to jump back for a second because so what Alex detailed was like another layer. And it's a pretty serious layer of work, of mind share on a daily basis that that is supposedly contributing to this college coaching brain drain false narrative that we've talked about on previous shows. Like you mentioned Jeff Halfley sort of, you know, using ESPN and Pete Thamel as a way to excuse away the fact that like, he couldn't win at Boston College and he saw a, a chance to go to the NFL as a coordinator. But if we're like evolving this we, GM role, GM role, and I want you to explain like what the GM role is going to look like specifically, would we not be alleviating the problem? Like, would we would we not be taking this off of the burden of the wide receivers coach who you know, doesn't want to have the weeknight game because he's got to hit the high schools because he's made these relationships, right? All of the tropes that we've heard in the world of personnel in college football for like that 20, 30 years could theoretically go away or just modify. And then 
again, I still think it's a false narrative based on the people who are sp- speaking it the loudest and the reasons why. But the idea that college coaches are drowning in work and it's NIL and it's this. So if you create a position that handles the personnel department, right? Won't that alleviate the football coaches just to coach, Richard? There is a tension on that that we will get to in just a second. But there is an alphabet soup of titles for college football front office people. Um, by and large, what we are discussing here is the person who is at the head of the snake of the personnel department. That person can be called general manager. That person can be called director of player personnel. Some teams have both of those things because God love you, college football. Um, some teams will call that person the associate AD of player personnel, whatever. For purposes of this episode, we are going to refer to all of those people as the catch-all general manager in college football. That's just what we're going to do for ease of use. The classical NFL um, front office, and yes, this has changed over the last few years as well, but it's general manager. It's a director of pro scouting, a director of college scouting. Uh, you have your cap guy, and then you have your your sort of like business president, CEO kind of person. The thing that Kevin Warren does with the Bears. Right? He's usually on top of the other people, I think. Yes, yes. but Between but, those uh, other people and the owner. Right. And Kevin Warren may actually be a bad example for this, but like Kevin Warren or the Kevin Warren job does not necessarily – operate the football operations right there's a but you know again kevin warren's a little bit different story um so that's classically how it is in college this is a relatively relatively new thing some regard matt dudek um as the first proper general manager in college uh that would have been do what god for 2012 2013 ish um he works some well, regard yeah, yeah, yeah. look that up yeah <laughs> Yeah. So this is some regard. State, yeah. Yeah. At Arizona, Mississippi State. Yeah. Um, the, the real person in my mind that jumps out as kind of the architect of this modern kind of DPP general manager thing is uh, Mark Pantone at Ohio State, uh, who was at Florida with Urban Meyer, then went to Ohio State with Urban Meyer. And, and he is somebody who is, I don't want to say the godfather of this, but um, he's a person who a lot of people in this world will kind of. That's the first person they think of. It's the first person I think of when I think about this. Um, but either way, you're talking about a, a proper GM. And, and what we're really talking about, I think, is the final form of the, so to speak, recruiting coordinator title, right? There was an era of college football staff building, and Godfrey talked about it early in the show, where you would have your, let's call it the wide receivers coach, for instance, and he was the guy. And the guy usually <laughs> meant he was the black assistant on your staff who could best and most directly appeal to black families and build relationships with them to get them on campus. And, and that was valued to a point. And that point became giving him the recruiting coordinator title. Now, that came with a raise and that, that, uh, and it, it sounds kind of fancy, but the recruiting coordinator is kind of assistant coach on your staff. Um, Look, there is forever a frivolous nature of being the ace recruiter on a college football staff. Some of it is how the task is viewed of appealing to the family of 16 and 17 year olds. All right. I get that. Some of it's also kind of racist. Because it, it fed into this thing that black coaches and minority coaches were not schemers could not cut it on the whiteboard and the chalkboard and that their strength was merely in acquiring the talent, which is funny because in college football might makes right on the field as far as talent collection and how that feeds into winning national championships. As we understand the university of Alabama, for instance, over the last 15 odd years. So in some ways I do think college football Developing GMs as a a real deal role is kind of a rubber stamp on the legitimacy and the need to legitimize the off field recruiting infrastructure and and have that person have a real deal proper title. I also think it's a way for black men 
who are not coaches to develop legitimacy on staff and 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 managerial a managerial role on the staff and and, and that kind of vein um there's some noteworthy black gm types uh on on a lot of staffs that you may not realize Corey phillips is at Colorado, uh, Gavin Morris at USC, uh, Brandon Harris. Yes, that Brandon Harris, the former LSU and North Carolina quarterback, uh, was recently named the GM at Texas, for instance. Uh, Sark, Sark actually raved about him. Uh, Butler Benton is at Notre Dame. He is actually the assistant AD for player personnel. Formally, that's his title. Um, Courtney Morgan at Alabama came over with... Um, with the new staff at Alabama and, and people say he basically made the roster at Washington, for instance, he was Michigan um, too. He, he had a yes. hand. I read the, read about this from Ari Wasserman in the athletic. He recruited a large chunk of the rosters for both of the national championship contenders last year. Yes. And, and one of the most interesting guys on this list to me is James Blanchard at Texas tech. Uh, he was at Baylor with Matt rule where he met Joey McGuire. And when Joey McGuire went to Texas tech, Joey was like, Hey James, come on, baby. And, and where I think James Blanchard is the most interesting name on this list is that he basically has unilateral ability, as I understand it, to offer prospects. And that is where we really get to the rub of this job that and is how, a little like that's a little bit different than all of right. the history of college football right when when we get there that is the nexus of where the gm role and college can get a little thorny and where the gm role is decidedly different than its nfl counterpart lord knows that as nfl free agency rages on um you know doug peterson is not going to be calling the free agents for the Jacksonville Jaguars. It will be Trent Baalke, and it will be Trent Baalke who is blamed if those free agents do not work for the Jacksonville Jaguars, for instance. Um, you know, just an example. But with Texas Tech, like, it, it, it's a little bit different, right? Even though it's kind of understood for those who know that James Blanchard may be, in, in some ways, offering some of the players that Texas Tech offers, it's still Joey McGuire's ass at the end of the day, Alex. It is. And I think that here's what's funny about this. I still think it's a minority of these general managers who get to do this, who are empowered in this way. But I know that it's happening at the top level of the sport. Like I know there are at least one or two of the bluest blue bloods who do this. I have heard in the recruiting world that the guy at Ohio State, Pantoni, who you mentioned, can pretty much do this. I've heard that from enough people that I believe it, that like the that day's general manager at Ohio State can pretty much just do it. Like what I'm interested in, and I don't know this part, is does a head coach who empowers that, you know, let's say it's Joey McGuire, Texas Tech, does he ever veto after the fact? Like, because mm. doing it just once is, could be seen as a bit of a disempowerment, like could really strip you of a lot of this authority if you're one of these general managers. And I imagine that that could also dovetail negatively with the empowering black administrators thing that you're talking about, right? Like if you're, if you're gaining legitimacy in a racially slanted org chart world of college football. And then the head coach comes in and says, "Hey, sorry, Brandon Harris of Texas. I'm just ma I'm just picking him randomly. I don't know what Texas's workflow is like. Uh, I need you to call this kid's family and tell him, sorry, I got ahead of my skis. Like that could really be a setback for career development. And so if you, I think if you're a coach and you give that power to a general manager, you better be really sure because it's kind of a castration if you do it." just the one time and so uh, like that's that's tough i should i shouldn't use that i i don't know the best way to put it it's not the right word but you understand <laughs> what i mean godfrey castrations the, i think castration is a great verb um uh, there, or, are, there are okay yeah. yeah that's actually a noun but um um the I, I it's interesting that we first went to the power dynamic 
because I want to back up a little bit. Not that the power dynamic is invalid. Your friend uh, Dudik, you had you, you said early teens, right? It was eleven to fifteen. Name GM at Arizona fifteen sixteen, but he was basically doing that job. We, uh, kudos to Arizona for being ahead of the curve. Um, I want to go back to the racial part of it because for so long those identities felt cemented on coaching staffs, especially in. I don't want to say the South because that's lazy because it was definitely more than just Southern states. In fact, it didn't really matter where you were if you recruited the South, which is pretty much everybody if you include Florida in the aughts and parts of Texas. You had the black assistant like you talked about. And the racial component was that guy was never going to be pushed to be a schemer. He was never going to be pushed to be any kind of like executive type. He was never going to be pushed to move up in any capacity whatsoever. That was the glass ceiling. That was one of the first identifiable glass ceilings for minority coaches. And so hearing this prospect, it brings about a lot of positive potential. But because I'm myopic, I guess, my first thought is they'll find a way to get rid of them now that they don't have to have them. Because you used to have to have X amount of black coaches because all of the financial offers and all of the money that transpired in the Bagman era was done under the table and vis-a-vis community relationships and family relationships. So you had to have X amount of black faces in black communities to make those things work. It's how you got the white money to the black community. You had to have black position coaches to go in there as the above the board representative to talk to mom and them, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If we're moving towards NIL or, you know, depending on when you watch this or hear this, maybe something past NIL, some sort of some sort of staff, compensation, salary, whatever you want to call it, employee labor, and you have a GM position, what is stopping them from just whitewashing it? Godfrey, I spoke to a black head coach about a year ago, and we were talking about this notion of do, does the value of relationships matter less in the post NIL era? And that, that he was speaking to both college that's scouting code, portals. That's a coded statement. Technically he, he was speaking both to pro, excuse me, college uh, talent acquisition and high school acquisition. So he was kind of yeah. painting the broad brush there, but you know, he was basically telling me, he's like, look, like, I can develop the best relationship possible with mama and them. But if school Y comes in at the 11th hour with a certain right. number that I can't or yeah. won't hit and won't is doing a lot of work there because why won't you hit that number? Well, it's not just because college teams are greedy and don't want to pay athletes. There is a notion on college football teams that NIL should not necessarily be the front-facing, front-loaded incentive for you to go to a school. Doesn't mean we're not going to pay you. It means we're going to pay you if you stick around. For instance, a lot of the times you structure NIL deals where they're not front-loaded on day one. They may have like, a signing bonus component to them, Yeah, but you really get a significant tranche of money in year two if you don't. It's like a, it's like a rookie contract. Instance. Yes. Yes. So, okay. Like so, it, let's, so pause for a second then. So what you're saying is I shouldn't necessarily swap out compensation with relationships. And accordingly, I should keep relationships. When we say relationship, what we're talking about in this specific instance is the presence of identifiable black males around young black males in, in white dominated spaces. So what you're saying is that if right now programs feel like you can't just make it transactional purely and there's still a core relationship element, even if it's the spine of the experience, then you still need to have identifiable black faces within that experience for the athlete. Is that correct? Yeah, I think right now you're trying to find the balance. Just just on a, on a base level, you're trying to find the balance between the relationship aspect and the compensation aspect. And that is something that I don't really know that a lot of places have a good um, have a good handle on. A and M has a very bad had a very bad handle on. I can't speak to the current staff. A and M had a very bad handle on it. It was compensation first and foremost. That's one of the reasons why they're in the predicament that they're in. The specific predicament, I mean, 
the whole goddamn roster just transferred, at least the best parts of it. Um, you know, we'll true, see. Yeah. We'll see how this plays out at Ole Miss, for instance. Ole Miss did a whole lot of compensation in the offseason of 2024, and we'll see how that plays out on the field. I don't know. I don't know. But there is an existential concern, I think, with a lot of black assistants about what the value, assistant coaches, I should say, about what their value is if you ratchet down the relationship aspect. That is yeah. a that is a significant existential worry for them. Broadly you know speaking, the- it, but broadly speaking in American employment, broadly speaking, one more time. DI is this third rail topic right now, but when you don't have to hire or you shouldn't hire out of this or let me rephrase that. When you're not made to hire by a quota or uh, there isn't an obvious need to fill a position with a particular minority. What we see in American business in white dominated spaces is they don't. So that anxiety would feel real then. Yeah. Also, Richard, the idea that it's it's about compensation, so it's not about relationships. When coaches bring this up as sort of a, an indictment on where college football has gone, I I don't have a ton of patience for it because if if you do think about every typical job in the workforce, one, you're getting paid, and two, relationships still matter. How many people listening to this podcast right now have gotten a higher comp offer to leave their job and have at least thought about not taking it because they like the relationship with mm. their immediate superior or their coworkers or the people above them on the org chart at their company. I've had that experience. Give me the Vox drama here, Alex. I don't appreciate it. Like (laughs) this has happened. This happens. And when a college football coach says, well, it's all about comp now and and relationships don't matter anymore. Do both, man. Like that's what the money is for. Why can't you build a relationship with someone who is also on your payroll or on your collective's payroll? Maybe general managers can help with that. Maybe, maybe you outsource relationship building. Because you're too busy calling plays. I don't know. But the idea that you can't do both strikes me as coaches asking for treatment that nobody else gets in American business. And I don't understand why it is covered so credulously when someone asks for or when someone makes that kind of point. Why we just accept that? I have Alex, a, I have the a, ceiling. Well, go ahead, Richard, and I'll ask a question. Yeah. The, the, Alex, what Alex is getting at, I think, speaks to the ceiling of the college football general manager and Godfrey, I, I want to, this is something that I, I think you're really going to, going to understand or be able to paint the picture. You've got a staff of 10 assistant coaches, some young, some old, some black, some white. You've got a staff of 10 assistant coaches in the bill parcels. Uh, the famous bill parcels quote, if I'm making the meal, why won't you let me shop for the groceries? Yeah. College football, college football has always been the most extreme version. And I think you could speak to the notion of we're going to very rapidly imbue power to this person who does not coach a position or call a ball play. Then you get into the ego dynamics yes. of a college football staff so and an what, assistant coach who may not have as much power as they think or as much sway as they think about who goes into their room, which is, again, very different than the NFL. Well, so I, I, this is kind of the direction I went ahead because I'll, I'll, I'll give you a, a belief, right? So if you're a longtime listener to the show. My favorite sports team in the world is a is a uh, woebegone NFL franchise. And if Atlanta were to win the Super Bowl next year, or the three years from now, whatever, and someone w- were to ask me who did that, who who's responsible for that, I would not say the coach. I really would not. And it doesn't matter that it's Raheem Morris now, or that it was Arthur Smith before that, or Dan Quinn bef- before that. I want to make that clear. I think the Raheem hire is pretty good. I don't know. Um, it's Terry Fontenot. It's the GM. Specifically, and when the GM was was the previous GM, Thomas Dimitrov was fired, and they were hunting for a new GM. I was laser focused. The way anyone listening to this or watching this might be on a message board when there's a new coach hire at a college program, because that's my belief as a as a a pretty educated football fan, not just a professional. 
that the GM to me is is more instrumental for the architecture of what ends up becoming championship pro, uh, uh, clubs, I should say, at the NFL level. So this is where I want to turn it because you guys have touched on. I think you've said the word ego about four or five times. This can't be an assistant coach anymore. It can't even be a staffer. Mm. Are we looking at potentially, you know, and and if you're not familiar with that Bill Parcells quote, it's was sort of spoken in vain because that idea lost in the NFL. Bill Parcells was talking about this, and I don't, I can't remember exactly what era of his career it was, but he tried to wrest control of personnel pretty much everywhere he went, and he was afforded those opportunities. And there are several other NFL head coaches in somewhat recent memory, Richard, right, that were attempting to do the same thing. I think Mike McCarthy tried to do this, right? Um, it, it fails. It doesn't work anymore. Like Belichick might be the last person it's ever afforded to. I don't think it's a trend. I think it's a permanent change. And now we're talking about that permanent change in college. So are we ready for the idea of duality? Because we operate down here in the in the college ranks with like a religious sort of mentality, right? We we talk about it. it's deification. I mean, my God, Dabo Sweeney, Nick Saban, whatever. Are we ready to to become um, polytheist? <laughs> like, uh, I mean, oh, do like, you mean like is Kirby is Kirby cool with the idea that? I'm just making them up. I'm not saying Kirby no. That's a good place to start with else. because, but is that's Kirby a good place to start with. Okay, with a world where he wins three more national titles at Georgia, and when Georgia fans talk about it, they say, "Man, we're so grateful to Kirby and Joe Dick Johnson, the the personal right. director." How many <laughs> like, years I, from now? All right, here's yeah. the extreme one. I'll throw it back to Richard since this is your this is your show. How many years from now do you have a program? Let's just say we do. We're we're in some sort of big two dominated culture for the next thirty years, and let's say it's like a have not in one of the Big Ten or SEC programs, like South Carolina, who I pick on all the time, and I'm sorry. They win a national title, okay, but they do it through pretty noticeable and like at like really amazing means of personnel construction, like the 1997 Florida Marlins or something. Where it's like we're gonna build this shit together and we're gonna win a title, and everything was a little bit of serendipity and a little bit of kismet, like. Or I'll give you a better example. Take the 2010 Auburn experience and throw it into a world of legal compensation, right? We kind of, everyone, like, it's a joke amongst our greater Banner Society extended universe, like Gene Chizik, comma, national title winning head coach, right? We do that. We joke now. So how many years from now, Richard, is there a statue in a place like Columbia, <laughs> South Carolina to one of these GMs? I, I think that's the that is the most final form of the job, right? You basically the job will have to be seen as an executive for that to happen, right? Again, we are making some leaps that that is gonna uh, that's years years from happening. Um, it probably starts with the codification, you know, assistant. I actually think the assistant uh, AD, the associate AD. I actually think giving the GM that title, I think, is actually a pretty decent start. Um, it, 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 now, who do they report to is one question. Will they, do they report to the head coach or do they report to the real deal athletic director? I don't, who fires I don't who? see. Who fires right. who? That's what right. I want to I, I don't. Richard, that's my question for you about the ceiling of this position. In the NFL, not always. If you if you're run well, the GM might be able to fire the coach. In some places, the GM certainly can fire the coach. In some places, he can't. Um, I don't think that that will ever happen in college football. <laughs> yes. Ever. Yes. And like, you know, and I, I don't mean to be the one saying, oh, wow, like automobiles or airplanes, truly that will never happen or AI will never <laughs> affect my job. You know, like, I don't want to sound like I'm overly old fashioned here, but that's never going to happen. Like the, the GM in college football will never be able to fire the head coach. So how, how are you? Much? Saying, what, wait, what? Where, where? What's the certainty? Just I'm not. I, I don't know if I disagree with you, but what? what you're very certain. Yeah, the money for one thing. Mm. That how is. A good, I mean, the money. What, what if the money starts to leak dollars. laterally? What? to get one of these GMs? I'm like, look, and look. Uh, granted, like maybe the money's not a perfect answer. We're sorting through this in real time. We didn't didn't rehearse this or even talk about it before. Maybe the money isn't the answer because NFL GMs, I think, make less than NFL head coaches just about all the time. Someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, I think, that's yeah, true. yeah, yeah, yes. yes. Uh, and they can sometimes fire the head coach. But uh, I think the other thing is sort of the 
cult leadership element of being a, 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 head, a head football coach in college. Like NFL head coaches, like maybe I can't perfectly relate to this because the team that I root for changes head coaches like once every five presidential administrations with the Steelers. It's kind of awesome. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of cool, man. NFL teams fire coaches every two years. Like, try to name every New York Giants coach of the last ten years. Like, God, like you can't. Okay, like you can't. They have a new one every five minutes. They'll have another. Dude, one it's it's the same. It's the same. And, like, and, create a player guy every year. I don't. I never know who's and coaching you can the do Giants. That. And coaches are fungible in the NFL because yeah. recruiting doesn't isn't doesn't exist. Not really. I mean, it doesn't. Consider, cons- consider this, Alex, because you're making. Uh, I think you're making a good point here. Um, let's take the Falcons. It's Raheem Morris now. Raheem Morris, like the the NFL head coach, has a a significant lack of touchstone with the fans versus the college football head coach. Yes. Raheem Morris is not going on a speaking tour of 10 stops in rural Georgia. Yes. No, like, a waste there's of time. Falcons fan who's like, if you fire Raheem Morris, my, my donations <laughs> are going to stop. <laughs> right, my, I, right. I'm not renewing my season tickets. That doesn't happen. And it doesn't okay. like e- Even Kirby Smart, for God's sakes, is going to have to go down to Macon, for instance, and talk to the Macon Touchdown Club. Like, that's just the way it works. Like, I was recently in South Carolina, and, and I was in Aiken, South Carolina. And look, if you've been to Aiken, you understand. And like Dabo Sweeney and Sh- Shane Beamer will have a speaking tour stop in Aiken, South Carolina, that a lot of people will come to. RJ, there is just a- you're throwing shade at so many mid-sized southern cities. <laughs> just like, can there you is, keep up? There's just God. a touchstone Watch out, with Huntsville. the head coach. There's just a touchstone with the head coach that the university community and the donor community will always have and maybe need that that creates a certain just just task so maybe the they head want that, that now the, so richard maybe that, maybe they want that because as this thing grows in popularity or or like press coverage this college gm which is the point of like what you described to us today you know maybe to, I, alex is alex is 110 certain and i think i am in my lifetime that you won't see that sort of supplanting but I do, I, I do believe to Alex's point in the deification sort of mentality of these head coaches. And I think now more than ever, Kirby needs to know, like Kirby's a bad example because he's won two national titles for a program that did not have one in my lifetime. So that's a bad example. But uh, so we, we might want to not use Georgia as, as a reference point here. But like Tim, you're Shane younger Beamer, than I thought, Stephen. What's that? <laughs> They, <laughs> they won in 80. Yeah, they won in 80. I was born in 81. You must have been so. born in 81, 82. That's right. That's right. 84. I am 76 years old. Um, the Anybody who can't claim a title, anybody who who is in that sort of like Mendoza line of satisfaction with your with your consumers, I think it does behoove you moving forward to be the guy at the rubber chicken circuit, which is just, that was an old name for the alumni, the alumni dinners that you have to do because they fucking hate them now. One of my favorite stories I ever wrote when I was a college football reporter was Nick Saban having to go to uh, Athens, Tennessee. And holy shit, was he just like he's he was eloquent and intelligent by how much he didn't want to be there, but he did not want to be there. Um, (laughs) I think now it's like, you know, maybe you're stumping to sort of, you know, maintain your sort of your deity status, if you will. It's going to be really um, fun to watch. Richard, take me home on this. If that's if that's the situation and. Let's say we're reasonably sure that at least not for a long time, the GM is never going to have more power than the head coach. What is the maximum form in like your lifetime of what a college football general manager can be? Yeah, I think there are some edge wise ways to do it beyond giving that guy a title, increasing that guy's pay and, and sort of taking them along that track. Um, look, college football personnel people are getting organized, not in the organized labor sense, but I do mean talking to each other. Um, there is now a personnel convention that I believe is going to be on its third iteration in Nashville over the summer. Yeah, it went. Um, it, it's it's becoming a thing. These people are talking. And by the way, I also don't want to ignore the fact that this is also a pathway for women to get into college football organizations. Richard, and, that and, crowd uh, was one third female. I've never yes, seen any college football event with that, with that many women. Castration if you disempower one of these. That's dude, why it's, I was it's, trying to catch it's myself. Fine, dude, but it's my fine. point is, you're right though, and I wanted to make that point. Like this is not even just for black men, but also for women to like have 
jobs in college football that are not uh, operations, that are not like that or are that start, significantly that, more that, powerful than there have been. That start in operations and then come up. Um, I, you know, I, I think some other edge wise ways uh, personnel people can and should be able to go out on the road either with coaches or in place of coaches. And remember, you want to get thorny with ego, that's going to get thorny with ego. But if you're an assistant coach and you don't want to fly to God knows where on Friday night, 12 hours before you play a football game to go to a high school football game, maybe just send the personnel guy. And yes, that's going to create a, 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 you know, the, the higher resource programs are going to be able to say, you're going to have to cap it. You're going to have to have some guardrails around it so that Georgia state can compete with Georgia relatively on. I understand. I get it. But I'm just talking about ways that you can start to I- increase and imbue that job with increased ro- uh, responsibility and make it more front facing. The other thing, and this is more of a final form way down the road thing. You really have to start to know who these people are. Right or wrong, you know who the GM of your NFL team is. The GM holds a press conference at the Combine. The GM holds a press conference the day after the season. The GM answers, you may not like the answer, but he answers for the roster decisions that he makes or that he makes in conjunction with the head coach. We don't have that right now. Maybe we'll never get there, but that's another thing. When you ask what are ways to, to imbue this job with, with, uh, with power, basically, it's a way to do it. It makes it more front-facing. Don't know if it's ever going to happen, but I, I think it's a way. Um, the other end of this, and, and it's not even, I don't even want to say it's, it's a negative, but The other end of it is I take in the 2024 coaching cycle, three of the black coaches who got hired, Sean Foster at at UCLA, Del McGee at Georgia State, and Fran Brown at Syracuse. All three of them were not the classical head coach blueprint. Sean Foster was a running backs coach. Del McGee was a running backs coach. Both of them, ace recruiters, Fran Brown, ace recruiter, and uh, corners, uh, defensive backs coach on the Georgia staff. So understand, and you know, a few years ago, Jeff Collins, who was an assistant coach at a lot of places, was also Nick Saban's director of player personnel at Alabama, then became the head coach at uh, at Georgia Tech. So I I think a little bit of what you're seeing is on another end, ADs, you know, crossing my fingers, hopefully, but being a little bit more comfortable with hiring capital R recruiter as their head coach. And and maybe that ends up with capital R recruiter actually being more open to giving their GM type more power on the staff or more sway on the staff. I don't know, but it's another thing that's kind of happening concurrently to what you're asking, Alex. So what I heard today was that in the near future, a female possibly minority GM is going to have the ability to fire a sitting head coach in the SEC. This is the America. That you guys asked for and it's coming 